LD, verify, go for launch. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Since the days of the shuttle program, one of NASA's main focuses has been the thermal protection system, or TPS, of its orbiters. Even though the shuttle program is over, the thermal protection system facility at NASA's Kennedy Space Center is busy. The team is not only working on the thermal protection system for NASA's Orion capsule, but also for many other commercial companies. Spaceflight Insider got a look at the newest materials in spacecraft reentry. Over the years, we made, I think, over 100,000 components for the space shuttle to maintain the fleet. It took around about seven or 800 replacement parts every time they flew, and the majority of those were sourced out of this building. Um, today, we're working on new vehicles, uh, and we're doing a lot of things that are quite different from the way we did them in the early days. Uh, you know, the shuttle was designed using the manufacturing and materials technology that was available to the designers back in the late 70s, early 80s, and there have been some huge advances made in materials technology and in also in manufacturing technology. The manufacturing equipment we use today is very much more advanced than it was particularly in the uh, area of CAD design and CNC machining. You know, the original billets, uh, this is a tile billet. This is the uh, uh, block of material from which tiles are basically machined. Not unlike commercial refractories used in kilns, in furnaces, in foundries. You know, it's, it's aerospace grade stuff. It's made to a much, much higher degree of fidelity than, um, you know, say stuff you'd use to line a kiln. You know, in the world of materials engineering, if the whole world was 600 degrees or below, life would be easy. We could use polymers for everything. Yeah, you know, easy to make, they're not that expensive, they can be formed into uh, interesting shapes. And, uh, you know, you can pretty much make anything you want out of them. They've got good physical properties, good strength properties. Unfortunately, there are very, very few plastics or polymers that will work above 600 degrees. So you move into the kind of 600 to uh, up to 1200 degrees. Now you've got some options still. There's some metals, titanium works very, very well up to that point. Um, you know, Rennie 41, Wasp alloy, you know, some of the exotic alloys. Unfortunately, they're metals, so they tend to be rather heavy. And they also tend to be fairly, have fairly high thermal conductivity. And they also have oxidation problems and structural changes driven by temperature and that kind of thing. So, but 1200 degrees is pretty much your cutoff for anything made out of metal. Now you get into the world of ceramics. Now ceramics have some wonderful properties. They're very stable. They're already oxides, so they don't suffer any oxidation problems. Uh, they can last in space forever. Um, they don't, uh, you know, they have inc incredible resistance to ultraviolet light, to radiation. Um, they have some properties that are slightly difficult to work with, but ceramics in general go up to 22, 2300 Fahrenheit without too much fanfare. And you know, you're getting close to the melting point of steel here, so you get some idea of where you are. Above 2300 degrees, you start to have some problems. Uh, there are some ceramics that will work in that 23 to 3000 degree range, but now you're getting close to the melting point of silica. And your conventional tile type materials start to have problems and the real difficulty is getting materials that will work at 3000 and above and this is the kind of regimen you get into with uh, beyond a uh, orbit re-entry uh, where your heat loads coming back from mars or from around the moon uh, or even the eft1 test flight you're seeing heat loads and subsequent temperatures that, that are in that 3000 degree range and uh, we're working on some material technologies uh, that, that will work up there. For example, on the Dream Chaser, you need materials for the nose cap, for the wing leading edge, for the body flaps. The Dream Chaser, comparing the Dream Chaser and the orbiter from a kind of thermal standpoint, it's kind of like comparing a boat to a jet ski. It's smaller, a little denser, so its re-entry is going to be a lot faster and a lot hotter. So looking at materials that work in that very high temperature range uh, is one of the challenges we're working on with, with SNC right now. Uh, we have developed tiles and tile coating systems um, that will operate in the 25, 2600 degree re, re, uh, range and you know, that's uh, proven to be very useful. But just to give you an example of tile coatings, this is a, uh, a very old shuttle tile and uh, you can see on this tile the coating is extremely thin 
and you know it really is very insubstantial. It's like an eggshell; you can put your finger through it fairly easily. Uh, and this is one of the things that contributed to the the, the damage intolerance of the shuttle TPS. Uh, now we've moved to a, a, a different coating system. Uh, you can see a section through a tile here where the coating is quite a bit thicker. Um, it doesn't add very much weight, uh, but it is significantly tougher. I can't, uh, I can't really damage this without the help of a screwdriver or a key. And, and one of the prime advantages of this, and one of the reasons they use it on the Orion for its uh, deep space purposes, is micrometeorite resistance. You know, uh, space is full of MMOD particulates, which, uh, you know, traveling at a very, very high velocities can do very significant damage. And uh, during the development of the TPS for the, for the Orion uh, and Ares before it, they, uh, they realized that these tile coatings in combination with the tile base material have extremely good micrometeorite resistance. Uh, the on-orbit and launch cycles are not easy on them either. You've got to form the outside skin of the vehicle that forms the aerodynamic aeroshell. It defines the, the external volume. But it's also got to withstand these temperatures of uh, you know, two and a half thousand degrees, give or take. Uh, it also has to be micrometeorite resistance. It has to have, be resistant to um, ultraviolet light, cosmic radiation. Uh, it must suffer no environmental impacts. It mustn't change. It's going to be up there for six months. It can't undergo any physical or chemical changes. And it has to weigh about the same as balsa wood. Uh, and that puts you in a particular box. And it was the same box the original shuttle designers were in and the Apollo guy before that. Uh, but again, materials technology and the knowledge we've gained through these programs has really allowed us to leverage some of these technologies and really make things a lot less expensive, a lot easier to produce, and an awful lot more reliable. While at the facility, Martin demonstrated how some of these materials actually work by taking them out of a kiln. What I'm going to show you here is uh, a little bit of a trick that's a good demonstration of uh, some of the properties of it. These materials are made fundamentally of silicon dioxide, of silica, uh, which is a, uh, an incredible material. It has virtually a very, very low thermal conductivity and uh, an extremely low specific heat. Uh, so it doesn't conduct heat very well. And what that allows you to do is to uh, pick up these coupons just to uh, fraction of a second after they're brought out of the kiln. Now the core of this is still well over 2,000 degrees, but the corners and edges have cooled off enough that I can uh, handle it without burning myself. Um, but it's a good demonstration that, you know, this is actually about 94% solids, 94% uh, air, 6% solid phase. And uh, because of the low conductivity, the, the core of it will stay hot for quite, uh, quite a long time. This facility has physically been around for 30 years. Um, there was another facility that existed before it, and this building was put in place by NASA to accommodate the needs of the shuttle program. But uh, we also did the X-38 manufacturing here. That's, uh, nobody really knows too much about that. And uh, you know, we have continuously evolved our processes, our equipment, and you know, gained a, a pretty impressive body of knowledge. Uh, as it pertains to the manufacture of space flight thermal protection system components. You know, originally run by Rockwell, uh, it was then operated by United Space Alliance as a government-owned contractor-operated facility uh, for quite a number of years, and now Jacobs Technology uh, are the operators. But the DNA goes all the way back. A lot of the personnel, the process knowledge uh, that existed back in the early days is still here. Uh, and it's a very rare commodity to still be a part of. There really aren't any other companies doing this type of work. It's very specialized. It doesn't overlap with the commercial industry very much. They're really kind of niche products. Uh, and our goal here is to uh, try and support as many of the government and commercial spaceflight programs as we possibly can. You know, through this, this manufacturing and processing effort, evolving the designs, evolving new materials, and, you know, basically furthering the cause of the U.S. space program.